welcome everyone. <laughs> Hope you're having a good day. I'm Kia Kokolicheva. I'm a reporter with Axios, and I'm based in San Francisco. And today I have here with me Jeff um, Kalafson of FAIR and Hiroki Takeuchi of GoCardless. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. Glad Thank to be you. Here. And we're going to talk about scaling unicorns, which is something that these guys have been going through and doing a pretty good job at. <laughs> um, so to get us started, could you guys each tell us when you founded your company and then what it does? Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and thank you, Kia, for this. And uh, this is definitely the most people I've been around in a long time, so that's <laughs> exciting. Uh, maybe I'll give the quick overview about FAIR, because folks might not be familiar with it. FAIR is an online wholesale marketplace that connects brands with retailers. So on one side of the marketplace are brands, people who make products. And this could be you know, people who make candles, other home decor, clothing, gift products, uh, babies, baby goods, kids and toy goods, kind of any category you can imagine. And on the other side are retailers. So these are small and medium-sized businesses. They might be offline. They might be online. They might be a mix of both. And FAIR connects the two of them. So brands come to FAIR to get distribution for their products uh, and to grow their business. They get access to 250,000 retailers today. And retailers come to FAIR to find great products for their store that we actually guarantee will sell in their store. So we offer free returns to retailers who buy products on FAIR. They can give the product back to us if it doesn't sell. And we couple that with net 60 payment terms, which means they don't actually have to pay us for 60 days. So they can pay us after they've sold the product. And a lot of kind of the vision and motivation behind the company is, can we take all these brands and retailers now around the world and unite them to give them a platform and a set of technology tools to really compete with the retail giants, the Amazons. Uh, my very American-centric example is the Walmarts of the world. I have to get a better European example. Um, and we started the company, launched live a little over four years ago. And today, we have about 30,000 brands on the platform. 250,000 retailers and on pace to do a little over a billion dollars in sales this year. So super excited about the growth so far. Awesome. Great. Um, thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Hiroki. I'm the CEO and co-founder of GoCardless. Uh, we've been around a little bit longer. So we, we started in 2011. Um, and what we do is we're building uh, the world's first bank payment network, uh, which makes it much easier to collect payments directly from someone's bank account without having to go through all the intermediaries that you see in the card networks. Um, so you know, we started the company in 2011 mainly because we were really frustrated about how hard it was to collect payments. And also, that the only way to collect payments at the time was using credit and debit cards, which wasn't going to work for what we were trying to build. And we were really struck by how inefficient and how complex the, the card networks were. So we looked for alternatives, came across these bank payment systems, and started building technology on those. Um, so we now work with about 70,000 businesses that collect payment through the platform every month, uh, processing about $30 billion a year in volume. Most of that focused on businesses with recurring payment models, which is you know, um, the, the kind of use case where bank payments have been the best fit up until this point. But we're super excited because there's a bunch of things that are happening in the banking systems around you know, faster payment rails, open banking, which are going to make these bank payment systems a much better fit for a wider variety of payment use cases. So you know, a big part of our focus now is building those technologies and you know, going into these new payment use cases, which we think are going to drive the next sort of stage of growth for the company. So. <clears throat> Obviously, you guys started your companies because you saw a problem and you had an idea for a solution um, or something new to bring to your target customers. At what moment, though, did you know this company is going to take off and be massive? Do you want me to go there? Yeah, I go mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm still kind of not sure we've, we've hit that point. It always feels like kind of the, the Jeff Bezos sort of day one kind of mentality to me in some ways, right? I, I kind of. When, if I think about where we started and where we are now, you know, I probably never would have dreamed of it. Um, but at the same time, sitting where I am now, I feel like there's still so much to do. So I'm not sure we've got to that point where I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to be massive. <laughs> like, I still feel like there's a lot more to, to be done. Um, but I think the, the point for me where it felt like uh, maybe there was something more enduring that we'd built was uh, probably actually when I had a cycling accident, which is why I use a wheelchair now. And um, 
this was back in 2016, so just over five years ago. Um, and you know, I had to take a bunch of time out, right? And up until that point, you know, I was living and breathing go karters every day, every moment, every hour. Like my wife never stops telling me about that. <laughs> um, but you know, I obviously had to take time out. And seeing the way that the team responded, the way that the company came together, the way that we continued to grow and you know push the business forwards. And if anything, I came back after six months and. You know, the, the business was in better shape than ever. So um, I think at that point, I, I probably questioned a bit what value I was adding, uh, but also uh, thought, okay, we're probably onto something here. Fair enough. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd echo what Hiroki said, where it definitely still feels like you know, day one, tomorrow, the term, or hard to feel like you're there. I think for me, there may be some earlier examples as well, but the most salient one for me recently is probably how we did during the pandemic. I think it was probably hard to imagine an environment more difficult for our customers. Um, many of our customers are offline retailers. They might have online businesses, but maybe they started offline. And they were first to close. A lot of our brands were struggling. And I think seeing how our customers adapted, how their customers, the consumers buying from them, ended up supporting them to help them kind of get through that really difficult summer last summer. And um, I think their ability to come out the other side of the pandemic and a lot of local and independent retail doing stronger than it was even before. Um, and then our business kind of ends up just reflecting the strength of our customers at the end of the day. We did some stuff on our end to really try to support them. We extended credit terms, tried to kind of adapt our business for that change in dynamic. But I would say seeing how the business accelerated through the pandemic, how our customers adapted, and I think really you know, helped us get through that as well, was probably a moment where it was like, this thing is, it feels like it's hopefully pretty enduring. <laughs> Makes sense. So shining through something that should have been challenging was a defining moment. Um, let's talk about international expansion. Obviously, we're in Europe. Um, everyone wants to be everywhere around the world. Tell me how you guys approach that, because that's a big undertaking, right? You got to leave your home. You got to <laughs> set up your business elsewhere. <laughs> how do you guys approach that? Yeah, sure. I can start. I think for us, the motivation for international and, and why we decided to do it, I think first and foremost came from our customers. I think we had hypothesis and believed that our marketplace, our platform was better when it was international. For the first time ever, really, you know, a brand in the US can access retailers around the world to sell their products. And a retailer in Portugal can source products from around the world, super easy, super cheap, find the right products for them. So we kind of had a hypothesis that the marketplace and our opportunity to build something global is really special. And we started by onboarding the supply side, the brands um, in Europe and in some other countries. And we saw North American retailers, so American and Canadian retailers, really take to that. They bought lots of products. I think it was really clear there was an opportunity there to create this liquidity across different regions. And so I think that, that was really the motivation for us. And we began investing in it about a year ago, we launched the UK in April, and then about 14 other European countries through the spring and summer. And I think I've been super excited about the traction that we've seen so far. Um, we're doing about, I think, the latest numbers, close to 200 million in, in sales in our European business, which is about where the US business got after three years. So I think the, the, the speed at which it's kind of caught up and overtaken to us has given us a signal there's something there. Uh, it's very hard, I would say, particularly localizing and making the product feel really good in every country is a challenge that we haven't really had to deal with. And I think we're doing okay today, but we definitely have a lot of work to do to make the platform, to make the marketplace feel really great, I think, to users and, and customers in, in all the countries we're in today. Yeah, I mean, for us, it, it was kind of a different story in some senses because... Um, you know, we, the, the whole premise of what we were building was building on top of the, the banking rails, right? And trying to move money directly from one person's bank account to another. Um, and that, that was, you know, when we first started, how we thought payments should work. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the big challenge with that is that you're obviously tied to the banking systems and the banking systems are very fragmented. You know, each country has its own set of banking systems, own set of banks with their own rules, regulations, in infrastructure. And so in the early days, this was a real big sort of blocker for us, right? Like we started in the UK, we built on top of the banking rails in the UK and you know, we created a really great product, got really strong product market fit, but we couldn't really help anyone outside of the UK because we couldn't collect payments there. And so that was a big frustration for us. And you know, it was only after a few years when we just realized, okay, well, 
well, let's turn that frustration into an opportunity. If we can be the ones that bridge those gaps and you know, connect all these banking systems together into a single platform and network, then you know, we think there's something really special to be built there. And so there was a bit of a more of a kind of a leap of faith that we needed to make where we were going to say, okay, we're going to invest in creating this global network. And so, you know, that, that's what we did. We now cover just over 30 countries that we can collect payments from, covers about 70% of the recurring payment volume globally and about 50% of GDP. Um, and, you know, from there, that gave us the platform to then start in investing internationally. And I think for us, you know, one of the big lessons I took from the early sort of attempts for, of internationalizing was that you really need to sort of go all in on it, right? Like you can't just sort of dip a toe in the water. And that's sort of the approach that we took. I think we were maybe a, a little bit scared to overinvest, you know, hire too many people on the ground. And as a result, you know, I think the, the, the first attempts that we had of growing internationally were, you know, a bit of a stuttering kind of uh, affair. But then it was only really when we just said, okay, you know, we, we really believe in this. We're seeing like how we're making individual customers really happy and changing their businesses, you know, but, but we need to grow faster. We need to invest more. And, and when we started to invest in you know, offices on the ground, you know, leadership, proper teams, um, that's when we started to see more, more traction. And so you know, uh, definitely a big learning uh, experience for us. You mentioned um, the fear of overhiring for something maybe you don't know if it's going to work. Tell me how you guys um, think about that, like adding a new division or a new region or a new product and adding headcount. And, you know, you, you never want to be in a position where you make a mistake and then you have to lay people off just a few months later because it didn't work out. So how do you guys approach that to make sure that you're not making a mistake <laughs> with people's jobs? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, I, I mean, I think that you, you kind of there's there's different categories that you have to think about this in. I think because um, some of it is more like okay, we're just gonna look at the numbers, right? And you know, what's the ROI on it? Are we seeing the right kind of sales efficiency? This, the right kind of payback on our investments, etc. That's kind of the easier ones to kind of decide on. I think that the, the more challenging ones are when you're taking a bet on you know something that you, you think is gonna work, you know, that you believe in. But it's unclear what the ROI is going to be because you know the, the time scale is longer, the opportunity is more uh, ambiguous, um, and you know I think the, the way I think about this at least is is about pacing, right? It's like okay, well, you know, how do you invest in some of these new things in a way that you know if they don't work, you don't just have to pull back, right? You can either redeploy into different initiatives, deploy back into the core of what you're doing. Um, and so, you know, I, I find that, like, you know, you have to get that right balance between, you know, investing behind the numbers, but then also, you know, taking that leap of faith that you need in order to invest in some of the things that maybe a, a little bit further away, but you think are going to have a really big impact in the long term. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Maybe, maybe the only other thing I'll add, and when you're scaling really fast or adding new divisions, I would say the risk of kind of the cultural fabric fraying or, or some of the values and, and the things that worked earlier on eroding is real. And some of the best advice I think we've gotten is maybe when you're doubling headcount is kind of right where I'd consider the danger zone and you know, a little above, a little below, depending with caveats on which functions maybe are, are scaling, um, is really who are you scaling? Because really when you're growing that fast or adding new divisions, you're almost kind of replicating or multiplying people and leaders. And there's a, a pretty big difference between maybe a, a more junior manager, a first time manager who is you know, increasing their team 50%, that might actually be really difficult for him or her. And that might be something that doesn't set them up for success versus a, a more seasoned leader, someone who's demonstrated the ability to scale a team, to take folks and produce outcome. You know, them growing 150% might actually be okay. You know, they have the right values, they've shown it, kind of replicating them makes sense. So I think one thing we've also tried to think about is even at kind of the gross high level, you're growing this much, who are the, the leaders and kind of the things in your, your company that you're replicating? And are you putting the right rating in the right places in the organization too? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, obviously, you gotta you gotta pay for all these people. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, that means funds. It means fundraising. How do you guys um, approach that? Um, especially, you know, maybe if we're in a boom market, everybody is fundraising. Everyone's writing checks left and right. Everyone's telling you your company's awesome and they want to give you money. <laughs> a lot of it, maybe more than you could even imagine. How do you think about what your business needs? What's available to you? What you will need? 
so that you raise the right amount and don't overwhelm yourself with too much cash that you don't know what to do with. <laughs> well, I, I think in, in our experience, um, you, it's difficult to raise too much cash. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, you always, whatever you think it's going to cost and how long you think it's going to take to do something, you're probably going to take longer and it's going to cost more. So yeah, I think that uh, we've sort of thought more of, about it from the perspective of making sure that we can raise the, as much as we can, but you know, obviously within the, the boundaries of what makes sense for the scale of the business, right? And so you know, I, I don't think there's a, a science to it. I think it's, it's pretty simple, really. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. I think you know, depending on your company culture, there may be a risk at times to raising too much money. I think if it, it depends kind of your opportunity set and maybe the rigor and discipline with which you run the business. Mm. Um, but I think the external environment is realistically a, a factor in kind of the art and science of figuring it out. And, Probably over the lifetime of both of our companies, the environment has changed quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I think it's a really good point on the culture, right? I think that's the more important point is not so much how much you raise, but more how do you manage the culture uh, through those kind of in, uh, situations? Because uh, you know, if people start to think that you know you've, you're already successful or already all, all of a sudden like you don't need to be as disciplined or you don't need to be as hungry anymore, you know, all of these things are things that can be a much more negative impact. But that, I think, is less to do with the amount that you raise and more to do with how you manage the culture afterwards. That's a good point. How did you guys manage that? I mean, I think it's something, honestly, that evolves based on the different sizes of raise and size of company as well. I think your messaging changes at scale. I think one thing that I've heard and I think we, we've echoed a bit is you know, fundraising and, and financings are a milestone along a much larger journey. They're certainly not the finish line. Um, they're important checkpoints, and I do think that they're worth celebrating and you should make sure to not kind of overcorrect on the messaging of like financing and fundraising doesn't matter because they are reflective of company milestones. You can only fundraise when you hit certain company milestones and celebrating those milestones is probably better than celebrating the financing itself, but they're, they're often really coupled and I think financing resonates with employees a lot as well. So I do think they're worth celebrating, but in the context of it is a milestone, this kind of sets us up for the next phase of the journey and in some ways we kind of just re-up the ante um, in terms of what the expectations are for us. Yeah, I fully echo that. I think, you know, focusing on the mission, right? Like, what, you know, where are you trying to get to? Yeah. What are you trying to achieve? And I don't think there's many startups, at least successful ones, where their mission is to raise money, right? <laughs> I mean, the raising the money is just helping you get there. Uh, but, you know, to your point, you know, also being clear that you know, whilst this is an exciting milestone and a real celebration, it's also an increase in expectations. And so you know, what we need to deliver now is even greater than what we were delivering tomorrow, uh, yesterday, right? So uh, I think that's super, super critical. Yeah, I think it's a really good point to use it too to reinforce whatever cultural values you want. I think that's a really big moment to kind of lean into those values. Like Absolutely. You know. Last question, and you each get 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> See the clock. <laughs> what is sort of the biggest surprise that you've encountered in your journey? Maybe an international... I have three seconds, I can see the clock on gun. Just how similar the customers are. The, the motivations behind the brands and retailers in Europe and, and what they want to accomplish and what they're looking for, they're just remarkably similar to the US. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a candle maker in Portugal in the overlap with somebody making apparel in LA has, has been surprising. Yeah, I think, I think for me, it's probably, uh, I always think about the, the Bill Gates quote about, you know, everyone massively underestimates what they can do in a decade, but massively overestimates what they can do in a year. I think that's my main kind of takeaway. When I think about what we've been able to do over the first 10 years of the journey, you know, every single step of the way, I felt like I want to go faster. We're not going fast enough. You know, everything's taking longer than I'd like. But then I sort of look back and think, okay, actually we've, we've achieved quite a lot here. Um, and so I think that's the, the main thing, uh, is the, the sort of the patience and uh, you know, s seeing things through and the importance of that, and then what you can achieve over the long term if you take that approach. Awesome lessons. Thank you guys so much, and thank you for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kia.